Good morning. Welcome. Those of you that remember to change your clocks this morning, we're so happy that you're here. Please stand as we um, begin worship together. I'm going to read from Psalm 150 this morning. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and flute. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, as you can see, we're not going to have the clash of cymbals or the flute or the strings this morning, but I have a whole congregation to join in worship this morning. So let's praise God and sing to the King. Uh, everybody is uh, enjoying your time to worship our King and our Lord, and we are so ex excited to have you here this morning, and welcome to not only those of you here in the sanctuary, but welcome to the people who are uh, online with us as well. My name is Ron Lindsay, and I'm a member of the congregation here, and uh, Dave Beetham is on a youth retreat, so as a result, he is unable to be here, 
We continue to pray for him and his ministry as he ministers to the youth. Uh, I'm here to give some announcements. Before I finish up, oh, can you guys sit down? This might just be just a few minutes. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm first going to ask Alethea Bosworth to come up and tell us a little bit about a wonderful opportunity that you have to feed your face. Yes. So I have a couple questions to start. Who likes pasta? Yes. Or gluten-free pasta also, some of it, yep, very good. So next Sunday at 5.30, we are going to have a spaghetti dinner. Mm. Put on by our youth who are all not here, so we get to talk about them when they're not here. <laughs> uh, we had 20 three students go this weekend, 23. Yeah, it's, God's doing amazing things in our youth ministry and here at Grace right now. So this is going to be a fundraiser. There is no cover charge to come in, but it is donation only as much as you are able and want to give because we are raising money so that all 23 of these teens can go to Unite, which used to be called Chick, and it is, there it is, it's going to be in Cincinnati, Ohio, it's going to be a full week of opportunities where they're going to be able to hear um, speakers, they're going to dive in deeper into their faith and understanding, they're going to have tremendous opportunities to worship um, with some very popular worship uh, bands. So bands that they think are cool, basically, is the way to say that. Um, so please come next week. We are taking donations for dessert. So if you are going to come, we're planning for everybody to come. So just come on down. We don't need it. We don't have to sign up or anything for it. Bring a dessert to share of any kind. And the teen's job, and I have challenged them, and I'm going to challenge them again, and you who come are going to get to judge them and give accordingly. Because I have told them that they're going to have to serve with the utmost graciousness. Because as they're, be as they're hosting, because they're going to be taking your orders, it's not buffet style, they're going to serve you. So the expectation is the utmost of hospitality to earn your donations so that they can all go and learn more about the Lord at Unite this summer. So next week, 5.30, bring a dessert and come enjoy as much pasta as you want. Thank you, Alethea. And uh, as a testimony, I know that many young people from Grace have gone to Unite, formerly known as Chick. Um, and have been a life-changing experience. So this is an opportunity for us to encourage and to uh, support our youth as they go to uh, Unite. Uh, a few other announcements that I'd like to make is, uh, one, this Wednesday the 20th is next Wednesday. That's, that's not coming this Wednesday. Next Wednesday the 20th is the Pinewood Derby. It is a all-church event. And uh, from going last year, it's a wonderful opportunity to really support our young kids, both Stockade and Gems. They have been working hard to uh, put together some uh, little wooden cars, watch them race down the track and come and support that youth ministry. I'm sorry, the children's ministry will also be providing refreshments. So that is Wednesday, it's March 20th. Uh, Silver Threads. For those of you who are 55 and older, that's this coming Saturday at 11.45. So welcome. Bring a dish to pass for those who are involved in Silver Threads. And uh, lastly, as we move forward here, this coming Friday, men, is the Cornhole Tournament. We are so excited to be able to give you this opportunity to compete with one another, have come and have a wonderful opportunity to fellowship and say, play some spirited games of cornhole. Uh, so please, uh, men, put that on your calendar for this coming Friday, 6 o'clock. We will provide pizza and wings. We will have dessert, 
And uh, I am looking for just a couple people who are willing to bring a salad. So if you are planning on coming um, and you're willing to bring a salad, please see me at the end. We will have a sign-up just so that we have some sense of how much pizza and wings to bring. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet over there at the Welcome Center, and a couple of us will be walking around with some clipboards to see whether or not you're planning on coming. This is only so that we have some sense of how much pizza and wings to, uh, to buy. And uh, Faith Builders, um, that is also a men's event. That is the third Thursday of every month. Now, for your question, as you get up and greet one another, the question we want you to ask is, what is your favorite picnic lawn game? So, <laughs> so now, you go picnic lawn games. How about bocce ball? How about badminton? How about croquet? How about can jam? How about ladder ball? And you might come... You might have some other ones in addition. So share your favorite picnic lawn game. Go. song that we're going to do is a new one. Um, I think it's a pretty easy melody. So I will play the melody as the intro so you can kind of hear it. And then uh, we'll give it a try together. See 
that calls me as I am. For hands that should discard me, hold wounds which tell me come beneath the cross of Jesus, my unworthy soul. His family is my own One stranger's chasing selfish dreams Now one through grace alone How could I now dishonor The ones that you See the children called by God Beneath the cross of Jesus The path before the crown We follow in His footsteps
awestruck wonder at the mention of your today with hearts of praise and worship. I thank you that you are who was, who is, and who is to come. And with all of our hearts, we have lifted our praise to you. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Ushers. see everyone today as we come together to worship. If you're visiting with us, if you're new with us, we are so glad that you're here. Uh, in the seat in front of you, somewhere in front of you, you'll see a connect card there. We'd love to have the opportunity to connect with you, have a chance to answer any questions that you might have. You can fill one of those out or, or scan the QR code and fill it out online. Uh, if you fill out the card at the end of the service, if you could just put that on our welcome desk out here uh, so that we can be in touch with you. And uh, there's also a, a bag out there with a gift that we'd like you to have uh, that's got uh, just some stuff in it. There's a coffee mug uh, and, uh, and some information about the church. And, and so we just like the opportunity to connect with you. So if you're new here or newer uh, in the last couple of weeks, please, uh, please do stop by and let us know that you're here so that we can connect. Um, Alethea mentioned at the beginning that we have a group of our teens that are out at uh, Mission Meadows at a youth retreat this weekend, and we're just excited about that. Um, interestingly enough, as the schedule worked out, um, we, we were kind of moving people back and forth this week because with us this Sunday 
is uh, Jackie Haynes, who's the director out at Mission Meadows. That's our, our covenant camp that's closest to us. A number of our kids, a number of our teens go there. Uh, many of you, uh, maybe as teens and kids, went there as well. And she's just going to come and share with us an update about uh, Mission Meadows or whatever it is that you're prepared to share. But, but you had a video that you wanted to show first, right? Okay, so if we could show the video, and then Jackie will come and share with us. Good morning, everyone. Um, as I, I've been told, uh, you guys talked about, was I have a whole bunch of your kids at camp. It's so wonderful. We have 108 kids here that week, this weekend, which is partly why I am here. <laughs> no. Um, but no, it's been wonderful. They're exhausted and they're fun, and I promise they're all alive. Um, but I do want to share with you a little bit about camp and uh, Mission Meadows. So this year, our theme is uh, Be Loved. And it's taken from 1 John 4, 19 that says, We love because he first loved us. And I'm going to talk just a minute about what that means. If you look at the word be loved... Do you, each of you, feel loved? And not just a little bit, but be loved means dearly loved. So do you feel dearly loved? And, and if we think about all the things that God calls us to do, we have to obey the Ten Commandments. We have to love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, right? And love others as ourselves. We got to worship the Lord. We gotta pray without ceasing, uh, memorize scripture, read scripture, spend time with God, listen to God, uh, act servant-hearted, be gracious and kind. So all these things that God calls us to do, can we really live up to that expectation? What about our children? Do they feel they can live up to your expectation or the world's or God's? What about school's expectations? Okay. So this summer, we are going to really strive to break that false understanding that we have. Our hope is that youth and families will leave camp this summer believing that they are so loved by God. We are made good. And goodness doesn't change based on our choices. To believe that we are beloved, we need to first receive God's love, and just be loved. That's the only thing we're going to focus on, is just figuring out how to be loved. Uh, this summer, we do have all kinds of camps for all different ages. You saw some of the activities that we do. Um, we also have family camp, which is a great opportunity to um, introduce uh, your family. And a family can be a uh, couple with kids, single mothers, it can be a single person, it could just be a couple, all different types, but it's a great way to connect with God and um, draw a little bit closer. It's also a great way to have a family vacation. And we're lucky enough that actually Alex from your church is going to be our speaker. So we're very excited about that. Um, that is the week of July 4th. And I do have um, brochures here. They look like this, okay? And it has all kinds of information in it. So I'll be around um, if you want to get some information. Uh, but the other things, um, I recognize that everyone can um, 
do camp or like camp, all right? And so, but we, but everyone can help us. We really need your prayers. Uh, let me tell you a couple just quick stories about how prayer changed Mission Meadows. I have absolutely countless ways that God has been working at Mission Meadows. It's kind of incredible, kind of scary to me. So one way, uh, my husband came to me. He's a facilities director. He's right there. He hates when I point him out. <laughs> and um, he came to me and said, Jackie, we need a new truck, and we need it now because we need to plow. And, and it can't be just any truck. It has to be heavy duty, right? And so $35,000, he tells me. I'm like, well, I don't have $35,000. So I called up some friends. And I'm like, I need you on your knees now, okay? Within less than a month, it was three weeks, actually, not only did I have a new truck, but I had another new vehicle that I could use to transport kids in, because that's how God worked, right? And, and we paid nothing, pa can't pay nothing, right? The most recent blessing that God has done through prayer is we had this $242,000 loan for a pool. $2,000 a month was spent on given to interest alone. Made me sick. It was the worst loan you could possibly think of. It was gone off the prime. So I'm like, what are we going to do? We, I, how are we even going to function, right? As of December, a gentleman came to me and said, I see what God's doing. I see the work that's being done. And you can't possibly do ministry and do all the things that you're doing with this tied to you. So here's a quarter of a million dollars, Jackie. Quarter of a million dollars, OK? So, um, so not, there was a condition only, there was a condition I'll share with you. The condition was, next year, I want you to do a capital campaign and I want you to focus on ministry, okay? So we're in the middle of really looking at what can we do to transform lives? And that is through the power of prayer. So if you would um, come with me, alongside me and pray, I have people that meet um, through Zoom, if you're ever interested, we do it monthly, and they, there's a whole team of people that pray for um, camp. I have a couple ladies who come every week on camp to pray over Mission Meadows, and then I have churches like yours that will pray for me, so if you would consider praying, that would be super helpful. Uh, the other thing that, another way you can help camp is our work week. We have a work week coming up, it's free, where you can come and help us get camp ready. And then in the evenings, we open up the camp to you. So we might have the pool open. We do have worship time available, maybe the rock wall, but you're able to fellowship and be with others as well as helping us for the week at the camp ready. That is uh, May 24th to the uh, 31st. And lastly, last thing I promise I'll stop talking, <laughs> um, is that I do have a, a, a list of needs that we have. There's a whole bunch of stuff. And we have anything from good to have items to critical and all different uh, categories. Some of them, let's see, I need some spatulas that are $10. I need basketballs that are 25 Oh, and if you have $30,000 laying around, I need a new steamer, okay? <laughs> so um, if there is anything, if you have some um, items or some money that you can donate, I will have these lists available too. Thank you for letting me be up here. All right, thank you, Jackie. So a lot going on there. Um, I was watching the promo video. The only thing I noticed there is I didn't see any of our kids in the video. So we probably got to do something about that. So uh, if, you're, if you're thinking about the summer, you got kids or, or grandkids that are looking for something, you know, something to fill that time, I know um, this would be a great opportunity. Maybe your kids are a little bit younger than that and, and you're not sure they're quite ready to go away. But still, check it out because that's coming. And, uh, and be thinking about how we can support uh, the, the ministry out at Camp Mission Meadows. Uh, but uh, let, let's do what Jackie asked us to do even right now. Let's join together in prayer uh, for that ministry. Lord God, we come before you today and uh, we've just heard an exciting report of what it is 
that you are doing at this camp. Lord, the, the ways that you have stepped in, as Jackie has just shared these testimonies about, uh, about how you have responded when your people have prayed and how you've, you, you've met those needs that seemed absolutely beyond, absolutely impossible, and yet, uh, Lord, they were so, uh, just so marvelously fulfilled. And so we just thank you and we praise you for that. Lord, we, we pray together that that would continue. We pray that, uh, that this weekend, as these 118 teens are out there uh, and, and, and finishing up now, but Lord, we, we just pray that what has happened there in that place would have made an impact in the lives of those people. We pray that there would be, uh, that there would be teens there even now making a decision to follow You as their Lord and their Savior even, even this morning. Lord, that, uh, that You would do a remarkable thing among them. And, and Lord, work among them. Uh, Lord, we pray for these camps coming up this summer. The kids that are going to be going out there, we just pray that, that, that through the work that's done there and the ministry that happens there, that, that, that Lord, these kids would come to know You and come to know You more and to, and to trust You deeper and to follow You more passionately. And so, Lord, we, just, uh, we thank You for this work that's going on there. And, and Lord, we pray that it might, uh, that it might continue. Lord, we lift these things before You. We praise You in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't we uh, go ahead and we'll invite the kids to head out for Discovery Zone. As they do this morning, we're going to continue our series in the Sermon on the Mount, but you're not going to hear from me this morning. Uh, so we're going to have Elijah Elmer, who is one of our uh, college now seminary students, uh, many of you know Elijah because uh, of his growing up here in the church or his involvement uh, as our summer youth intern over the last, uh, our summer intern over the last couple of summers. Uh, but if you haven't met him, uh, that's who Elijah is. So Elijah's here on spring break and he's going to come and share with us from God's Word. So come on up. Good morning. Good morning to everyone who's here. Good morning also to all of those who are listening online. I wanted to just quickly plug uh, both Mission Meadows and Unite, which was formerly called Chick. I remember I went to both of those camps and retreats, and they just had a massive impact on my life. And I truly don't know if I would be standing here today if it wasn't for those two ministries. So check them out. Come to the uh, spaghetti dinner, the pasta dinner, and, uh, and donate, and let's get our teens there. So as Pastor John said, this morning we're going to be continuing in our sermon series through the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 42. Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 42. Now this passage is going to represent Jesus' fifth of six teachings in the Sermon on the Mount on the law. And in his teachings, he's going to look at different laws from the Old Testament and how the people in his time have, the Pharisees and the scribes have misinterpreted or misapplied these laws, and he's going to give his own interpretation, the correct interpretation. So today we're going to be looking primarily at Jesus' teaching on retaliation. Let's read together. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we're in your word this morning and we listen to the teachings of your son who came down and put on flesh, becoming incarnate for us, bearing our sin and our shame so that we would be made right with you. We pray that we would take his teachings to heart, Lord, and that we would reflect his image in the world around us, in the things we do, the things we say. Lord, we know that your word will not return void, so we pray for your Holy Spirit to work in us even now. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So this morning I want to begin by reading an excerpt from one of Charles Spurgeon's sermons, a famous preacher. His sermon was titled, Christ's People, Imitators of Him. He said this, As God may help us then, first of all, we will speak of what a believer should be. A Christian should be a striking likeness of Jesus Christ. You have heard lives of Christ beautifully and eloquently written, and you have admired the talent of the persons who could write so well. But the best life of Christ is his living biography, written out in the words and actions of his people. If we, my brethren, were what we profess to be, if the Spirit of the Lord were in the heart of all his children as we could desire, and if, instead of having abundance of formal professors, we were all possessors of that vital grace, I will tell you not only what we ought to be, but what we should be. We should be pictures of Christ. Yea, such striking likenesses of him that the world would not have to hold us up by the hour together and say, well, it seems somewhat of a likeness. But they would, when they once beheld us, exclaim, he has been with Jesus, he has been taught of him, he is like him, he has caught the very idea of the holy man of Nazareth, and he expands it out into his very life in his everyday actions. And I think that encapsulates most of what we are learning throughout the Sermon on the Mount. Simply, kingdom citizens are supposed to reflect the image of their king. Kingdom citizens are supposed to reflect the image of their king. Now, how many of us in here have grown up with siblings or maybe even just a close friend? Siblings or close friend? Yeah, raise hands. Yeah, so most of us, right. So I grew up with a brother who was two or three years older, depending on the time of the year. But him and I growing up together, yeah. (laughs) Uh, We would often, as brothers do, get into arguments or scuffles. And many times these arguments would turn into different physical altercations, right? Maybe he takes something of mine, eats my leftovers, you know, there's a many different things he could have done. But these things would, that, that started small might turn into these physical aggressions where you know, he might give me a little bit of a slap and then I turn around and I give him a punch and, and then he kicks me or, or whatever. But as they escalate, right, I think what we see there is that we all inherently have this urge and this posture to seek revenge. Right? As humans who are battling with our sinful flesh, we readily adopt this posture of revenge. And we see this in the entertainment that we consume, right? If you think about action movies, and I love action movies, so I'm not condemning these movies, but there's the main protagonist, and the antagonist does something to the main character, and the rest of the movie is just the main character systematically taking out all the the people that the enemy guy cares about, right? And so these are the things that we've seen. And so we see that we have this posture to seek revenge. But what Jesus is calling us to in this text is that he's calling kingdom citizens to respond radically different than the cultural precedent. Right? We as believers are called to adopt a posture of reconciliation, not revenge. Because we know that God will deal justly with those who have wronged us. And so in this text we'll see that Reconciliation for us looks like giving up things like our pride, our possessions, our resources, our time, our aid in service of the kingdom. And so simply, we are to love those, even those who have wronged us. So I believe there's three texts that Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 5, three passages here, that bear down on the passage we have this morning. Matthew 5, verse 10 says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 19 and 20, the end of verse 19 says, but whoever does them and teaches them, what Jesus is teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, where the scribes and the Pharisees are teaching an external righteousness, it's all about outward actions, not internal affections. It says, unless your Righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And then verse 48, which we will look at later, 
He says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And, and surely we know that in this life as humans, we can't be sinlessly perfect. That's why Christ came for us and he lived the life that we couldn't live, died the death, and paid the price that we couldn't pay. But that doesn't mean that we don't strive for perfection to be Christ-like. And so I think here the word perfection can be seen as a completeness, right, or a maturing in our faith. So those are all texts that are going to play into what Jesus is saying here in our text this morning. So first, we seek reconciliation, not revenge, because that is God's intent for us. We seek reconciliation, not revenge, because that is God's intent for us. Jesus begins, he says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This would have been a common phrase in that time period. And it's just a, a phrase that, see, uh, that speaks of the retribution for a crime that has been committed against you. And as I said earlier, Jesus is speaking of Old Testament teaching, right? Teaching in the law. So this phrase shows up three different places in the Old Testament. Exodus 21, 22 to 25, Leviticus 24, 20, and Deuteronomy 19, 21. So I'm just going to read from the Exodus account. Moses writes in the law, When men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm, the one who hit her shall surely be fined, as a woman's husband shall impose on him. And he shall pay as the judges determine. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Now it's important here to understand that in all the contexts in which this eye for eye saying was used in the Old Testament, it was always meant for the judging society, for the judges in the land, not for individuals. Right? It's not meant for individual interaction. But it was a way in God's law that because of the sinfulness of man, this would restrain evil, right? And it would make sure that the punishment fits the crime. See, as humans, and as sinful humans, we often try to one-up the offense that was given to us. So we don't simply want an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth, but we want an eye for a tooth, or we want a life for an eye. So this teaching here was a way to guard against that, to guard against unjust punishment for a lesser crime or for dealing too lightly with a greater crime. And in our society, we have governing authorities that have been put in place, like the government, like our church body and church governance. Those are different ways in which they can distill punishments or judgments that are fitting the offense of the individuals, but that was never meant for us as interacting with each other to dole out. So what's going on here and why Jesus is saying that you've heard it said this way is because the Pharisees have, have been misunderstanding and misapplying this thing. You see, they're taking what was meant for the judging body and they're placing it on individual interactions. And this worked because man has this inherent love for vengeance. And a love for vengeance in terms of justice is not inherently wrong. But if it's not done in that light, it's misplaced. And so a, a definition of vengeance here would be punishment that is inflicted or retribution exacted for an injury or for a wrong. And so Jesus is not saying necessarily that this principle is wrong. No, in theory, it's good. And when it's played out by the judging authorities, it restrains man's evil. But he's saying that our application of it is wrong. See, vengeance does not belong to us. Vengeance belongs to God. Paul writes this in Romans chapter 12, verse 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. 
for by doing so you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So as hard as it may seem when someone wrongs us to restrain from our, our retaliation, we must trust that it is God who will make it right. It's not us. It's not on us. We're not seek to find our, we don't seek to find our own justice, but instead we seek God's righteousness and we know that in His righteousness, He will judge them, whether in this life or in the next. So we seek reconciliation because that is God's intended purpose for us. We seek reconciliation, not revenge, also because that is our witness to the gospel as kingdom citizens. Jesus says, But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. Do not resist the one who is evil. Now this idea is, is tied into loving our enemies and loving our neighbors as ourselves, and Jesus will expand on this uh, later in the Sermon on the Mount. But what this is not saying is that Christians are never to resist evil. Throughout scriptures, we see many times we're called to resist evil. We're called to resist the evil one, the devil. We're called to resist evil in societies, whether that be means by our actions or our inactions whether that be through legislation, working in the government, things like that. We also see that Jesus himself resists evil. I think of John chapter 2 when he goes into the temple and starts flipping tables and he's calling out the evil in their society. And in fact, he's doing the same thing throughout the Sermon on the Mount. But what Jesus is saying here is that by loving our neighbors well, through our actions, right, we are in a sense... Resisting evil, right? Here, Christ is forbidding personal retaliation. Paul, again, in in Romans chapter 12, here, verse 17, says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Therefore, as kingdom citizens and following after our king, we overcome evil by doing good. And so what Jesus is going to do in the following verses here is he's going to give us four illustrations. These four illustrations are going to illustrate the principle of giving up of ourselves, our possessions, our time, of loving our neighbors well. But it's important to understand that these are illustrations to illustrate a principle. They're not strict rules to be followed. Right? We don't want to pigeonhole ourselves into only doing what Jesus says here or only doing it to the limit that he says here or we will misinterpret what he's getting at. So we look at the first one. He says, But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him also the other. Now this is the proverbial saying, turn the other cheek. And it's been used many times throughout Christian history to call for strict passivism, to not ever engage in warfare or things of that nature. It's also sometimes been used to prohibit self-defense. And that's not necessarily what Jesus is getting at here. Right? This is not a polemic against war, and it is also not a call to never defend yourselves. Surely, if someone breaks into your house and is going to harm your family, those you love, you are supposed to fight back. And that's what you know, we're called to, defend our family. Right? And it also doesn't mean that if you see someone being wronged out in society that you're supposed to just sit there and let things happen. No, that's not what he's getting at here. But if we take it too literally, we can miss that and fall into a misinterpretation. Rather, what he's saying here in the cultural context is that if someone was to slap you on the right cheek, right? so we have a a right-handed person slaps you on the right cheek, your right cheek would be over here, that would be a backhanded slap, which in the culture that Jesus is speaking in would be seen as an insult. It would be seen as an insult. So this isn't speaking of an assault. He's not saying if you are punched, just sit there and take another punch in the face. But he's he's saying if you are insulted, right, bear the insult. Do not retaliate. We are called to to fight for the protection of others. And in, in some cases, we are called to defend ourselves, but we're not called to retaliate in anger or revenge. See, in our our culture, people are not often running around and insulting people by slapping them in the face. 
I'm an RA of, of 31 guys, an assistant resident director of 287 guys, and I, I can assure you there's plenty of insults that go around, but there are not too many people getting slapped in the face. So in our culture, it looks quite different. It's a verbal insult, or it's a passive-aggressive comment, or a big one here, it's a, a post on social media. And so through any of those avenues, we have either been insulted or we've used those, those avenues to insult others. And we know that following Christ in this society will often lead to persecution. And Jesus is not saying that, that we're not supposed to expect this persecution, but he's saying instead that we're blessed when we endure this persecu persecution without retaliating. We should fight for the rights of others, but we should humble ourselves and we should endure attacks against ourselves. Right? We should give up our pride. Peter writes this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 20 to 23. He says, For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ has also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to those or to him who judges justly. So that's what we're called to do. We're called to take the example of our Savior and instead of reviling back when we have been reviled, we are to humbly entrust ourselves to God and his justice. Jesus continues. He says, And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Now again, in that society, we can think of a tunic somewhat as a shirt today. right? Jewish men would often have multiple tunics, maybe four or five of them. And so Jesus is saying, if, and, and he's speaking in a legal context here, if someone sues you and tries to take your tunic, give your cloak as well. Now the cloak is, the coat is different, right? It's more expensive, and often you'd only have one. And that coat is very important because that's your protection in the night. That's your warmth. That's your blanket. That's your protection when you're traveling. And truly, in Old Testament teaching, you are allowed to sue someone for their possessions, money, cattle, things of that nature, and you can even sue them for their clothes, but you can never sue them up to their coat. So you can take their tunic, but you cannot take their coat. It's written in Exodus chapter 22, verse 26 and 27, it says, if ever you take your neighbor's cloak in a pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down, for that is his only covering, and it is his cloak for his body, and what else shall he sleep? And if he cries to me, I will hear, for I am compassionate. So Jesus is saying here, even if in legal action someone is coming against you and he is trying to take your possessions and he is not able to take your coat, even be willing to give that which cannot be taken. I think a good example of this is Christians in the early church. See, the early church Christians were under some of the most immense persecution that we can imagine. And I know in this country, we don't face extreme persecution, but there are places in the world today where they are under very harsh persecution, where they do have legal action that's being taken against them, and they are being sued for their belongings just for proclaiming the name of Christ. But Christians in the early church were subject to much legal persecution. Let's read what the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. He talks of the early church. He says, But recall the former days after you were enlightened, after they came to a knowledge of Christ. It says, You endure, endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering your, of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. 
How did the early church endure the persecution, the suffering, the legal attacks against them? They focused on Christ. They focused on their future reward that they had in Christ. And so in both the illustrations that we've seen so far, we see that one of our motivations for enduring this persecution, for this hostility, is the fact that we have our hope set on Christ. That is one of our motivating factors to carry on in the trials of this world. And so saying, have, have your hope set on Christ, is, is a simple saying, but it can somehow be, it can somewhat be complex. So I think for us, a way to apply this would just be simply be in the Word. Utilize the means of grace that God has given us to commune with Him. Read your Bibles, be in prayer, be in communion with other believers. If you are an older believer, pour into a younger believer. If you're a younger believer, sit under the tutelage of an older believer. And these are ways that we encourage each other to continue to have our hope set on Christ. And so what Jesus is getting here in the second, in the second illustration is that we should adopt a posture of giving of our possessions. We should not hold so tightly to those things that we have earned in this life. And Jesus will get to this later in the Sermon on the Mount that we are not to store up treasure on earth, but instead we are to store up treasure in heaven. So instead of holding so tightly, we need to adopt a posture of giving. We read from Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that as believers, we should be content with things simply as having food and having clothing. And truly, we should be content with just knowing Christ. So even though in that society, the disciples would have the legal right to keep their coat, Jesus is saying, don't hold tight, so tightly to those things. Trust in me, have your hope set on me, and be willing to give up even that which you do not need to give up, because that is what he's done for us. So we look to the next illustration. He says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Now this, this uh, going the extra mile saying can also be somewhat difficult to understand if you don't have an understanding of the cultural context. At this time, the Jewish people are under Roman authority, and under Roman law, a soldier could require a citizen, uh, a, a Jewish person, or any person under their control, to take their belongings, the Roman soldier's belongings, and carry that for him for a mile, for up to a mile. And so that was under the law, and it, at this time, the Jews would have hated that obligation, right? It would have been seen as shameful, right? But it would also have been seen as an inconvenience, as taking up of their time. Because they could stop you at almost any time and, and require you to do that, even if you are traveling, right? We think of Simon of Cyrene carrying the cross of Christ, right? He's, he's, he's traveling, and the Roman soldiers very much likely said, hey, you're, you're going to now carry this burden. And they could require him to carry it up for one mile. But they couldn't ask them to carry it for any longer than that. And so what Jesus is saying here is even if someone requires you, right, if a soldier requires you to take his stuff for one mile, be willing to go even that extra mile, more than you're supposed to. And I believe what Jesus is saying here is he is calling us to be giving with our time even when it's inconvenient. He's calling us to be giving with our time even when it's inconvenient because often the times in which our time is, is most valuable to us are the times when God will give us ministry opportunities. And the times where we have these great ministry opportunities is often never the most convenient times for us. So I have a couple questions for us. How do you use your time? Do you covet it and guard it against others who would seek some of it? What is your posture towards spending your time in service of others or the kingdom of God? I believe just as Jesus has told us not to grip too tightly to our possessions and not to grip too tightly to our pride, we are instead supposed to give them for the ministry of the kingdom, and we're supposed to do likewise with our time. One of my professors, Dr. Kimball, when he was giving a talk on godly disciplines of a man, he talked about time and time management and discipline as being interrelated 
to loving your neighbor as yourself. He saw time management and discipline as part of a, a ministry for others. Here's how he described it. He said that he works intently on his tasks to create margin, margin as these sacred pockets of time, to fulfill Jesus' command to love our neighbors as ourselves. So he took tasks and he completed them in good manner so that when the time came that he had to be present with someone who was in need of his help, he would be able to help them and he would able to, he'd be able to fully be there present with them and not thinking of all the other tasks that he has to complete. And I just remember that being so uh, just revolutionary in my thinking about time and time management and how I use my time. And so that's something that, that I've always tried to implement since then. So as an RA, when I get back to my dorm, I'll often have people coming to me with questions, whether it's about the word or just things going on in their day, things they want to talk through, things about their major. There's uh, many different questions I'll be asked. And I had to learn to adopt a, a part of time management where when I get my assignments, I just go to the library, I knock them out. So as soon as I go back home, I'm there. I'm present, and I'm willing to, to minister to those that God has given me to minister to. So I think just, just an example of how we can be diligent with our time so that we can use it for the sake of the kingdom. And so that's what Jesus is saying here. If someone calls you to go with him one mile, go with him two miles. And lastly, he says, give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Simply, the heart of a genuine Christian is always open to the needs of others. The heart of a genuine Christian is always open to the needs of others. I say it's always open, but that doesn't mean that Jesus is calling us here to simply give away all of our money and all of our possessions to every single person that asks us. If we did that, we would all have no money and we'd have no ability to give anything to anyone. Rather, we are to be discerning, right? We're trying to understand, is our aid helping this person? Is it enabling this person? Sometimes it might be more wise to give someone food or clothing or shelter rather than just simply giving them our money. But we're supposed to have that posture of care and generosity. John, in his first epistle, writes many different tests that believers can read through his epistle and, and test the genuineness of their salvation, and he writes it so that we'll have assurance of our salvation. And one of the tests that he writes about is a Christian's heart posture towards generosity. John writes this in 1 John chapter 3, verse 17. He says, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, and yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Simply, our love for our God and our love for our neighbor is shown in our heart posture of generosity towards them. And when I think about what we have read as we've walked through these different illustrations of Jesus, I think there is a Jesus does it perfectly, and we'll, we'll get to that, but I think there is another biblical character that, that illustrates this point very well. And I think of the story of Joseph. And time doesn't permit me to walk through all the intricacies of his story, but Joseph is a man who was betrayed. He was shamed, insulted by his, his brothers, those closest to him. They took his cloak. They took his, his tunic. He was thrown into prison. He was shamed. And yet, through his response, great glory was brought to God. So I'm going to read here from Genesis chapter 50, starting in verse 15. This is a summary of Joseph, Joseph's life in ministry. It says, When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, the same brothers that wronged Joseph, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. And he certainly would have a right to. At this time, he was the second most powerful person in the world. He could have enacted any type of justice he wanted. It says, So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of your servants, of the God your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. 
But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? Am I the one that has been given the prerogative to judge? The answer is no. It says, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph's response to the wrongs that had been done to him was an opportunity to portray God's glory. And I think that can be true in our own lives, right? Our gospel responses to the things that happen to us open gospel opportunities. So we've seen up to this point that we seek reconciliation, not revenge, because that's God's intended purpose for us, because that is our Savior's calling for us. And then finally, we seek reconciliation, not revenge, because that is what Christ has done for us. Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 7, some of the most beautiful verses in all of Scripture. Paul writes, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. While we were enemies of God, We were insulting our Creator by our lives and by our actions. We were challenging His his goodness in our own made-up courtrooms. Sometimes even challenging His very existence. We were using Him as a means to get what we want, but not as the supreme treasure that we should adore and serve. While we were doing all those things, He had mercy on us. Paul says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And through his death, he reconciled a people to himself. And through that reconciliation, he repaired relationships with each other so that we now can, through Christ and through his spirit, love our neighbor as ourself. That we can respond in generosity and love when we're faced with affliction. Christ did not come seeking revenge, but he came seeking reconciliation. On the way to the cross for us, he was beaten, Soldiers took his tunic, they took his cloak. He was made even to carry his own cross. But on the cross, he saved those of us that could only ever beg of him. He gave to the ones that beg, even his life. And through the giving of his life, for those of us who put our trust in him, now we can have life. We are enemies, now made friends. Outcasts, now called sons. This is what Christ has done for us. And so because of his example, he is calling his kingdom citizens to adopt that same posture with each other. If that is what our Savior did for us, that is what he's calling us to do with each other. So as we've seen, we seek reconciliation, not revenge, because it's God's intent for us. It's our Savior's command for us. And it's the example that Jesus has set for us. And so we understand that our gospel responses in these times of affliction in the times where the things that Jesus talks about in Matthew 38 through 42, Matthew chapter 5, 38 through 42, when those things happen to us, our gospel responses lead to gospel opportunities. So I have a couple points of application for us. First, simply follow Jesus' commands. Do not harbor a heart of revenge, but through your faith in Christ and your faith that God will deal justly, respond to conflict with love. When everything in you is is calling for you to respond in revenge and insult, when you don't want to go that extra mile, when someone sues you and goes after your things and you want to grip so tightly to your possessions and your time, entrust that to God. Entrust it that God will be the one to judge justly and instead set your hope on Christ. And then second, capitalize on gospel opportunities. See, gospel responses lead to gospel opportunities. It's important that we understand there's a witness in how we respond to conflict. 
Our response when someone insults us, our response when someone would take from us, our response when someone wants to take of our time, even when it's inconvenient, those are moments where we can show the love and grace of Christ because that is what he has done for us. And by doing that, we are able to share in the wonders of our Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would never graduate from looking at the the goodness of your gospel, from looking at the example that your Son set for us on the cross, that while we were enemies of, of you, you loved us and sent your Son for us. Lord, I pray even now that your Spirit would work in us so that we can enact that same type of love with those who are around us that we can respond to insult with love, to conflict with care, to malice with mercy. Work these things in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. search the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough then you came along and put me back together and Satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Won't fall.
for bringing to us a message about Christ and what he calls us to. Uh, as we prepare to leave today, I've been told uh, if you received a card this morning for the Grace Men's event, uh, that the date in the center of that card is not correct. It says the 14th. This event is going to be on the 21st. Okay, so make sure you change that. This should be easy to remember. The correct date is 321. Okay? So... Uh, Lord God, as we prepare to go from this place, Lord, we have today uh, been, been brought into your presence in song and, and through the, the teaching of your word, Lord, we have, uh, we have seen how it is that Jesus, uh, well, it is Jesus who demonstrates for us at that cross what it means to, uh, to live out this teaching. Lord, he didn't just teach it to us, but you lived it out. And may we go from this place. May we go from here to be those who can embody that message that others might see Jesus as well. Lord, we praise you in all of this in Jesus' name.